so <laughs> thanks so much, Aaron, um, and thank you to all the Broken Sleep team for publishing Bloom. Um, it really meant a lot to me. Uh, I've because obviously I've uh, mostly written uh, I've written short stories for quite a long time, but hadn't done much with them. Um, and uh, it was really nice to feel <laughs> validated as a short story writer because I've mostly written poetry creatively up till now. Uh, so yeah, it was really lovely that you liked it. Um, and yeah, with the the songs, sometimes people have thought that it's actually like a book, like it's some kind of album or something. It's, it's not, it's a playlist that goes with the stories. And I was thinking of the songs as um, almost like the closing credits to the story, although sometimes the song comes up also within the story, like it's playing in the background <laughs> uh, as a character's in it, in it, in it. So I guess it was almost like thinking of it in a slightly filmic way, even though they're very much written stories. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read a story called The Psychic, um, and the song that goes with this one is um, Aquarius Let the Sunshine In by The Fifth Dimension, and I chose that song because um, it starts off very optimistically and then it's got like this real visceral mood shift halfway through. Um, uh, so yeah, the story isn't like literally embodying the song, but it felt like it fitted the mood of this story. Um, and I'll just go straight into it. <laughs> the Psychic. Lola had complete faith in her dreams, which told her the truth. For example, one night she dreamed that her husband was having an affair with her best friend. She walked in on them both just as his tongue was entering her cunt. Oh, hi Lola, her friend said without surprise, and Lola's husband looked up with a mild answering the door expression, his chin still wet. How could you be so inconsiderate of me, of my feelings, Lola shouted, but in the stifled voice of dreams. When she slammed out of the flat, her front door was perched at the climax of a chalk precipice. She sat with her bare feet covered in chalk dust, dangling over the edge and watched the sea break far below. She woke to her husband snoring loudly. She considered shaking him awake, but her vision was clear. That morning she acted as though nothing had happened, although her heart was broken. Her husband was hunched over the toaster with his face still full of sleep. She looked at his dishevelled hair, the familiar mole on the back of his neck, the delicate bones of his ankles and swallowed. You're quiet, she said, touching. You're quiet, he said, touching her curls. I'm just tired. We're all tired these days. Lola didn't reply. Outside, the 7am June sky was right, white as a sheet. She kissed him goodbye at the train station where they usually went to work in opposite directions and watched him step aboard his train. She waited on her platform, but instead of travelling into work as she usually did, she took, a plane, uh, she, <laughs> she took a train directly towards the sea. On the way, she texted her boss to explain that she had a personal crisis to attend to and she didn't know when she would be coming back. She said she hoped they would understand, though she knew that they would not. It was hard to fathom destiny. She turned her phone off and gazed out the window at the graffiti landscape, rushing away into pitching downs and pale streamers of fog. The seaside town was bright and calm and chipped. Lola walked downhill past cafes streaming into life beneath crying, wheeling seagulls and sat on the pebbled beach and looked out at the ocean, waiting for it to give her a sign. It was still early morning. The clouds had cleared, letting through some diluted sun, which had intensified slowly to glitter on the horizon. Lola stood up, stretched, stripped off her work clothes, folded them on the stones and walked in her underwear into the cold water. She was submerged and shivering. As she waded, her foot, foot struck a sharp outcrop of rock, but the waves numbed her pain. She unhooked her bra and let it trailed behind her, then lay on her back and closed her eyes. The water moved like fingers through her hair. Long ago, she had a boyfriend here who she loved helplessly. He didn't love her back or not enough to tell her so and not all the time. Around him, her thoughts melted into the heat of her needs. She was hungry but had no appetite and slept badly. It was no sustainable way to live. One night she dreamed that she walked naked for miles over cracked concrete and gravel and dust and grit to reach his front door. 
He opened it and said quietly, oh, Lola, you can't stay here. Then he carried her back the way she came, cradled against his chest. In the dream, he was like a giant and so apologetic about his inability to love her in the way she needed to be loved that she couldn't even be angry. She knew it was really over then. That was the beginning of her faith in dreams. Now floating on her back, she cried nostalgic, salty tears for her lost life. She'd first seen her husband in a club dancing. The lights gleamed over the sheen of sweat and covered his skin in morning dew. She felt her breathing move into a more comfortable rhythm just by looking at him. He had an amused and intelligent face. She watched him at the bar silhouetted in flashing neon and thought, if that man looks back at me in five seconds time, I'm going to marry him. Five, four, three, two, one. He looked back. How could fate send her such a false sign? She sighed and propelled her way back to shore, moving her arms gently like a sea anemone. It was so early that only a few people were out, and none were close enough to shout at her, mock her, stop her, or any of the other things that people do to naked women. She wrung out her wet bra, clipped it, and pulled on her work clothes, then slopped up the beach to a vintage shop on the seafront. She bought gold leggings, a pink shift dress, and silver sneakers, with her hair dripping onto the counter. The cashier asked suspiciously if Lola was all right, and she said yes, of course. With these clothes she would start her new life. She took off her wedding ring and put it inside her purse. She explored the town all morning, drifting from souvenir shops to cafes, then entered a small shadowy bar with a staff wanted sign. Her outfit seemed to impress the barman who gave her a trial shift right away. His name was Lucas. He taught her how to make mojitos, from which he took small minty sips throughout his shift. He was so fascinated by alcohol, by its ingredients, the colours, deft twists of sugar and lime on the rim of the glass, that she wondered if he loved it more than he could ever love any person. But his eyes were as grey as the sea in her dream, which she was sure must be a good sign. At the end of the night, they dried glasses together and Lucas asked where she lived. She said, nowhere, I just got into town. He blinked and asked where exactly she planned to get a hotel at this time. She said brightly that she would find somewhere. Well, he said, she could crash on his sofa that night if she wanted to. He lived in a flat above the bar, it was clean. Upstairs, he offered her a nightcap and she said, no thanks. So he said, well, tea then. She sipped tea on his sofa with his small dumpling shaped dog, Bessie, curled beside her and a scratchy wool blanket around her shoulders. After a long expectant silence, Lucas said goodnight, then retreated into a dark hollow of his room. Into the dark ho hollow of his room. The flat was small enough that Lola could hear him breathing and sense the warmth of his sleep emanating through the door. This continued for two more nights. When Lola wasn't working with Lucas at the bar, she walked Bessie and swam in the sea, then sat in the cafes reading secondhand paperbacks, turning the leaves with clean, salty hands. She kept her phone switched off. As she read and stopped and glanced out of windows at the sea, memories of Maria kept surfacing. Maria was Lola's best friend, who she had last seen with her husband's head trapped between her thighs. When Lola thought about Maria, she had to put her book down and her coffee went cold. Maria had a gift for intimacy and a small and a full rich laugh that echoed through rooms and made people turn towards her like the sun. She created through friends what her childhood hadn't returned to her. Sometimes she had panic attacks. When that happened, Lola held her hands to stop them from shaking and brushed her long wavy hair away from, the, from her face. Maria was like a sister to her. Lola had thought that her husband was also protective of Maria. She remembered him bringing Maria her coat at the end of long evenings at their flat, holding the coat up by its sleeves in the shape of a crucifix and Maria disappearing into it. Lola considered hurling her phone still switched off into the waves, but didn't feel ready. Instead, she thought about Lucas. He skewed their conversations towards her so instinctively that it was only clear afterwards that he said nothing about himself. He had, she thought, low self-esteem. I want to know about you, she said on the third night as they were drying glasses together in the closed bar. Tell me anything. What's your favourite film? Oh, I don't know, he said. Transformers? 
She laughed and he echoed her uncertainly. Is that funny? You're in your thirties, she said, and reached to tuck a strand of hair behind his ear. He put down the glass he was holding with a jolt. A crack rang through it. I like action, he said, and kissed her clumsily. Soon she was up on the counter in the shuttered bar and he was pulling her tights apart. Sex was uncomfortable on the hard surface, but he kept saying, oh my God, oh my God, as though this, this was the most amazing thing ever to happen to him. And she was so touched by this that she cried into his neck. He asked if he'd done anything wrong and she said no, she was just overwhelmed at which he looked pleased and proud, although she'd bent, emotionally speaking. He kissed her on the forehead and Lola imagined reassembling the blocks of herself into a new as yet unknown shape. That night she lay awake beside Lucas's breathing, his arm flung over her like a heavy rope. When she finally slept she had the last and worst dream. Her husband was crying and wailing in the corner of Lucas's darkened room. Where are you? Are you dead? And his voice was apocalyptic, with sadness. His eyes looked bruised. She wasn't sure if she was dead or alive. She might now be a ghost. When she got up and looked into the cracked mirror over the sink, her face was vanishing into a sea mist. This dream was a very clear sign, erasing all previous signs. So in a sweat, she kissed Lucas's sleeping shoulder, left a note saying thank you for all of his troubles, but it's over and do not look for me ever. Signed it, Lola XXX, put her ring on her finger and walked back to the cold station to wait for the first train at dawn. Um, yeah, so I chose that one just because that character made me laugh. It's just um, <laughs> sort, of, <laughs> sort of a character who, who really does receive her dreams as prophecies and where that would lead her. So yeah, I hope you found that mildly entertaining. I will stop there because I don't want to take up too much time. And uh, thanks uh, so much for listening.